One. All right. We're going to start talking about the Industrial Revolution and specifically industrial growth in areas of manufacturing, agriculture, transportation, and some communication innovations that occur in the early 19th century. This is part of the theme of work exchange and technology, as well as looking at the impacts on the environment and the impacts geography played in all of this. So you have some serious shifts in technology and work in the early 19th century. The North was pretty grounded in uh, manufacturing, and the South, by 1860, cotton was the primary crop in the South and represented 57% of all total U.S. exports. The profitability of cotton, known as King Cotton, completed the South's dependence on a plantation system and slavery. So you start to see sectionalism and a real division between the North and the South with regards to labor practices in this time as well. So you can see this with regards to the number of manufacturing centers um, and the population that was engaged in 1840 in manufacturing and trade was primarily centered up here in the Northeast and that left the Southeast with agriculture. So um, with this manufacturing, the Industrial Revolution begins actually in England in textile mills and creates an increased demand for that cotton. Um, and then those textile mills are moving here to the United States as well as we saw that it was beneficial to actually manufacture the fabric here in the United States rather than shipping all that cotton overseas. So a man by the name of Lowell created um, what became known as the Lowell Mills um, in Massachusetts and there was nothing there initially but little hobbles, and then he created a huge manufacturing system and factory, um, and that starts kind of a new idea about manufacturing. So Francis Cabot Lowell invented the first factory system where people and machines were all under one roof rather than having artisans and crafters making their own fabric and wool, etc. Now you did it all under one roof. They needed to be near water because they were water-powered mills. Um, we didn't have electricity yet or steam power. These mills and factories were built primarily near Boston on the Merrimack River. Uh, they combined the textile processes of spinning and weaving under one roof and essentially creating a mass-produced high-quality cloth. Most of the workforce in these factories in the 1820s were immigrant girls. Um, so, so here are is an advertisement for actual jeans and clothing and denim. So denim comes about at this time. These are a couple of actual Lowell girls. Young ladies had uniforms. They lived in dormitories. Um, most often they were immigrants coming from a lot of times Ireland, but also parts of poorer parts of Europe. They often wrote home and talked about the conditions in the factory, which were not ideal. Um, and this is one such song that was written. Oh, isn't it a pity such a pretty girl as I should be sent to the factory to pine away and die? Oh, I cannot be a slave. I will not be a slave. For I am fond of liber liberty. I cannot be a slave. So this was a work song that was created by Lowell girls and sung in 1836 about the conditions in their factories. Uh, here you can see it was very dangerous machinery. These are leather straps that are constantly moving. Women were expected to wear skirts and aprons and still maintain um, sort of some of that 18th, I'm sorry, 19th century decorum. However, um, that created pretty dangerous working conditions for moving parts. Uh, you can see here are their times. Like I said, they live in dorms. Um, they had standardized work clocks. This is where you start to get steam whistles and alarms that would call people to work. Um, and when they could take their lunches and their breaks 
and when they could commence to leave. They were very long hours. You commence work at 7 a.m. and you leave work at 7 p.m. except on Saturday evenings. Breakfast was at 6.30, dinner's at 12.50 in the afternoon, and those were the two meals that you got. Um, all of this, uh, you had to punch in, basically, and this becomes the modern manufacturing blue-collar jobs that we know today. With this came a lot of environmental issues as steam engines are introduced and coal is introduced um, to create power for these machines. Pollution comes along with it. Um, and environmental degradation, rivers were polluted, air was polluted. Um, in a lot of cities, people would write and describe how it was unhealthy to breathe the air. And this is an actual photo of that time. You also have agricultural innovation that occurs at this time. The country is more spread out. You need to move crops to market quickly to prevent spoilage. So as we are expanding our territory west, we got to figure out how to get to the ports of Louisiana and New York and Massachusetts and, New and, and Pennsylvania and those sorts of places to get food to market. And you need to do things quickly. So the cotton gin is invented and patented in 1794. Initially, um, cotton had to be physically hand separated from the plant. And that was a very um, costly, labor intensive, timely process. So Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin and it speeds up that process. So now you just have to worry about having a lot of people to um, pick it which means that you have um, a need for more slaves. So here you can see the seeds being separated and, and the plant materials being separated from the actual cotton um, in a cotton gin, and you need more cotton to get more cotton. So that means that you need more slaves to actually process those bundles. So in this time period of the early 1800s up until the eight late 1840s, you see a pretty big expansion of the use of slavery, particularly in the slave holding South. You know, you look at the major cotton production areas in 1820, cotton expands by 1860 further and further West. And that means that you need to increase the number of slaves. So the primary slave holding areas mirror cotton production. Here are some images of slaves actually picking cotton in the fields from sunup to sundown and sometimes even in the dark at harvest time. It's, it's very backbreaking, heavy work. Um, it damages your hands, um, exposure to the elements. It was pretty brutal. Then the bundles would be put on barges and floated to the nearest ports and sent to the markets in New England, in the mills in New England, or to England. The other item that was invented in 1837 was the steel plow by John Deere, and this could be pulled by a team of horses, and you, you could um, essentially plow up much more land much faster. So again, this contributes to increasing the amount of acreage that is being used for cotton production. You also have Cyrus McCormick who develops the reaper. This is for primarily reaping wheat. Um, rather than going out and hacking it down by hand with a scythe, you could now hack it down with a machine that was also pulled by horses and was mechanical. And again, you could harvest much more um, crop in a quicker amount of time. So that meant you were planting more acreage as well. So with all this, you get transportation innovations, too. We had a vast network of rivers connecting the nation in the northeast and the east. So there was a need for good roads and canals to move bulk goods from the rivers to the ports. Um, and as a result of this, you see the invention of the steam engine, which revolutionizes transportation. You also have the introduction of a national road. This is the idea that travelers who were heading westbound and eastbound uh, with huge Conestoga wagons 
i.e. the big hitch, if you've ever seen those big wagons at Wagon Days, um, were hauled from Frontier Farms to the East Coast, and they needed a good solid road that wouldn't be muddy in the spring so that they could get their staples to and from markets to the home. As thousands of people moved west, these coaches became more and more in use, and so again, there became a need for a national road. So the national road system ran through initially from Maryland to Indiana by 1852. It was the first improved highway system in the United States. It was also known as the Cumberland Road because it went through the Cumberland Gap here in Virginia and Maryland. Um, and from here, there were canals that connected to Lake Erie, as well as to the Ohio River, and you could get goods to and from those interconnected transportation routes. The Erie Canal was a water canal that was dug to connect um, essentially northeastern ports with places like the Great Lakes um, and create a navigable water route from New York City and the ports there to the Great Lakes. It required a series of locks because the um, there is an elevation gain, not of a ton, but of a, a, a bit to get to those lakes. So here you have the Erie Canal and it spans across New York and heads into also um, Lake Ontario and then from there ships items could be put on ships and sent through the rest of the Great Lakes. These canals had a road next to them and these barges were then hooked up to teams of horses and the horses would pull the, the barges up the canal or down the canal um, with on this road with these teams of horses. This is a series of locks. When you have elevation gain, um, you have to move a boat into a lock, fill it up like a bathtub, and then it can go into the higher level water above. And so locks were built. These big gates block water, and then water would be pumped in. Pretty significant engineering feats. Then you had the invention of the steam engine in 1807, um, and Robert Fulton creates the first steamboat to carry passengers. It was called the Claremont. It was also it was fitted with a paddle wheel, but you see it also had sails because they didn't trust and weren't 100% sure that they would be able to get it to go, um, and so there were sails just in case. And those turned into ultimately these big paddle steamships that moved up and down the Ohio River, the Mississippi River, and the Missouri Rivers, moving goods and passengers. Um, they're called tall stacks because they would have these tall stacks. This is the paddle wheel, which is covered in the back, but it's giant, um, and it would turn and push the boat up or down the river. This is the era of Mark Twain. You also have your first steam ocean liners that are happening. Traditionally, ocean ships had these large sails, and once again, there was a desire to have sort of a combination boat just in case. By 1804, you're using those steam engines on locomotives. Um, this is really funny. This little locomotive was pretty dangerous, actually. It would spew um, ash. Uh, and it would land on people and catch their umbrellas on fire. But the first public railway was built in 1925. In 1830, I'm sorry, 1825. In 1830, there was a race between a steam locomotive and a horse, and the quote, iron horse, or the locomotive, won, and it sort of shows a turning point and, and how trains would not be just a novelty. And in fact, you can see here in 1830, very few, the red lines are railroads. By 1840, they're moving further and further in to the interiors um, and connecting, like I said, the Great Lakes um, to ports. This is Cincinnati on the Ohio River, and then you could get on the Ohio River and sail down to New Orleans. Um, New York and the East Coast are being very useful and you're even starting to see those encroaching into the south. Now, 
there's a problem up until the 1840s who is living here competing with farmers in the south native americans with the indian removal act of 1830 you remove large portions of the population who might have opposed railroads in the south and so after the 1830s, you start to see an increase in the number of railroads in the South. However, it is still far less um, accessible by railroad than the North and the Northeast. And that becomes important when we get to the Civil War. By 1870, you have a transcontinental railroad that we'll talk about in the next unit that goes all the way across the, the United States from California and the gold fields in California to the um, eastern part of the United States. By 1880, those networks are even more entrenched. You can see, though, again, the Northeast has far more um, railroads than the Southeast. By 1890, it's getting more in the south as well, but you also see for other rail lines up in the northwest. With this comes communication and innovation. Samuel Morris invents the telegraph, sending electrical signals over a wire. Communication over hundreds of miles is now instantaneous. He invents Morse code um, in the 1830s and 40s, and as rail lines were put up, at, so were telegraph lines. They usually paralleled the railroad tracks. Here is Morse code. See if you can tap out uh, a message. I can't figure it out. By 1866, there was an actual telegraph line that was laid across the Atlantic Ocean and connected the United States to Europe. So what once took in the 1790s three months to communicate with Europe, we could now do it instantaneously by 70 years later. So that's a pretty huge technological revolution that occurs as a result of this Industrial Revolution. So some things to think about as we are studying these and moving towards the Civil War. How did the environment and geography shape and affect these sectional economics? Um, you can see those geographical differences and environmental differences when you look specifically at those railroad maps. And then think about how the growth of manufacturing and the urbanization of the North affected people's definitions of work and relationships between workers and employers. What could potentially happen there? A little foreshadowing. How did agriculture and the dominance of agriculture, particularly in the South, affect slavery um, and the social and political and economic life in the South and the West? It's things that we are going to explore. All right. It's been fun. It's been real. It's been real fun. <laughs>